Okay, let's turn our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 16. Sin will cripple or destroy you. We all know the scripture that Paul uses in Romans concerning sin and the wages of sin, which is death. And so sin has a purpose, only one purpose, and that is to cripple you or destroy you. There's no doubt about that. Sin has no other purpose but to do that. There's no fruit involved in it. There's no blessings. It's just cursings. And God has designed it that way so that we know and understand that we're in need of Him because we are sinners beyond measure. This evening, we will look at Jeremiah as he is going to be directed to be antisocial. And I'll talk a little bit about antisocial. And then also in chapter 17, he talks about our sinfulness. And so two points that I'll make tonight as we go through these chapters. Jeremiah continues to warn and exhort the people to return to God, although he encounters threats and personal rejection from the people. And God just seems to add on top of that uh, as a um, prophet of God. In chapter 16, his message of, of approaching judgment that Jeremiah was to deliver and to illustrate with a lifestyle of celibacy and social detachment from the people around him. It is interpreted by a brief promise of restoration, which we see throughout Jeremiah that every so often God says, but I will restore you. You Judgment is coming, you'll learn your lesson, and I will restore you. And it takes about 70 years to restore Judah after the captivity into Babylon. And then he concludes this chapter with a vision of the future Gentile conversion, speaking of Jesus Christ after he ministered to the Jews. So let's look at verse 1, as the Lord um, will direct Jeremiah to do something interesting here. The word of the Lord also came to me, saying, You shall not take a wife, nor shall you have sons or daughters in this place. So immediately he he is directed not to take a wife and not to have children. In the Old Testament, we find that there is a teaching that God's blessings are upon marriages and those marriages that are fruitful. There's a blessing that comes with that. Oftentimes, the religious leaders of that time would look upon a married couple that had no children as a curse from God as though God was cursing them for some sin and so forth. So they were considered to be a cursed family without children. And yet we see here that God is actually asking Jeremiah not to marry and not to have children. A man was expected to get married, and usually by the time he was 18, he was already married. Marriage at 14 or even 15 wasn't even uncommon at that time. The Talmud pronounces a curse on a young man who was not married by the age of 20. And so there's the stigma of marriage, and Jeremiah understands that, and now God is pretty much telling him, I don't want you to get married, and I don't want you to have children either. Um, Now, why? One is God is protecting Jeremiah and his family Uh, from what is about to come, the judgment from the Babylonians to the children of Israel. Many will die, many children will suffer, there will be uh, famine, there will be destruction in their lives and so forth. So he's protecting them in a sense, but he's also also letting the children of Israel know how disgusting he is with them. Look at what he says in verse 3, For thus says the Lord, concerning the sons and daughters who were born in this place, and concerning your mothers who were born... Uh, they, who bore them and their fathers who begot them in this land. They shall die gruesome deaths. They shall not be lamented, nor shall they be buried, but they shall be like refuge on a face of the earth. They shall be consumed by the sword and famine, and their corpses shall be meat for the birds of heaven and for the beasts of the earth. For thus says the Lord, do not enter the house of mourning, nor go to lament or bemourn them, speaking to Jeremiah. For I have taken away my peace from this people, saith the Lord. Loving kindness and mercies, both the great and the small shall die in this land. They shall not be buried, neither shall men lament for them, cut themselves, nor make themselves bald for them. Now, bald for them. Uh, Usually when... When, when people would pass, 
from this life to the next, it was always a custom for them to mourn. They'd put on sackcloth, they would mourn, they'd, they'd actually hire mourners to come in and they would mourn the death of their family members. Uh, they wouldn't shave for 30 days at least. And what God is telling Jeremiah here is, don't even, I want you to shave. I don't want your beard to grow. I want you to be different, and I want it to speak to Judah. Nor shall men break bread in mourning for them, to comfort them for the dead. Nor shall men give them the cup of consolation to drink for their father or their mothers. So Jeremiah was told that he could not participate in the normal customs of mourning. Now, how would you feel? If a loved one passed away in, in, in your family and there was a, a loved uncle or a loved patriarch that everyone just loved and everyone would expect to be there and he doesn't show up, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? That would be interesting conversation with the family. Why isn't so-and-so here? Don't they love us? You know, Why wouldn't they show up? What kind of people are they? You know, so you can see the dilemma that Jeremiah is in here as God is basically saying, I want you participating in the mourning. I want you to keep shaving. I want you to eat bread. I don't want you to mourn over these people. Uh, he could not have entered the house during the time of the funeral meals. And so this command would further isolate Jeremiah from the people because they would interpret it as his actions as what? As an uncaring person, right? An uncaring person. Hard place to be for Jeremiah as it is he has a hard time getting the message of judgment off and yet he has to display these examples that God is telling him to display for the children of Israel and it's isolating him even more from from those that uh, he definitely loves he goes on and says in verse 8 also you shall not go into the house of fasting to sit with them to eat and drink For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will cause to cease from this place before your eyes and in your days the voice of myrrh and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. So now he's forbidden to even celebrate with them. And so if there's a celebration, if there's a marriage, I don't want you going and celebrating with him. Again, isolating himself from the community, isolating himself from, uh, from those that love him and, and those that he is to, to love. And so he couldn't participate. Is he being antisocial? Well, this is a command from God for him not to participate in these functions. The Bible's called us to fellowship one with another, hasn't it? It's pretty clear when we read Hebrews that we're not to forsake the gathering of one another. Now, everyone interprets that differently. We have people that will come along and say, well, we're tired of church. Church is the old way. Uh, We don't think that church is working. We don't think it's relevant. We don't think it's for today. We need to be more modern. There was a there was a time several years ago where there were people within the Christian community that was that were thinking that church was going to to diminish and fellowship in homes would would begin to grow, and they felt like in the end times that that those fellowships in the homes would actually be the churches in society more than the church itself. Well, that hasn't happened yet. I haven't seen it, though that's a good thing to have uh, home fellowships and so forth to be kept accountable. Um, Today, we have a great push to make church relevant. Don't make it traditional. Uh, The old way, you know, it's it's in the past and we need to modernize it and so forth. And, And I think that that's fine and that's okay. You see various churches with all kinds of different um platforms in the back with lights and you know pictures and drawings and they try to update it what is important is that the fellowship is there that's the most important thing fellowship we can't be antisocial god hasn't called us to be antisocial unless he's speaking to you personally but there's a plan and a purpose for you to be antisocial don't make the mistake to to think that god's called you to be antisocial because he hasn't called you to do that. Now, he may call you in a specific event, in a specific uh, life of an individual, but he hasn't called us to be antisocial. He's called us to have fellowship one with another. And we're not to forsake it. We are to go to church on a regular basis. It should be a priority in, in our lives as believers. It was a priority in Jesus' life to go to all the synagogues. 
on the Sabbath day. The disciples did the same thing after Jesus had left, and, and we see that throughout the scriptures. Uh, the home fellowships that were, were taking place during the time of the disciples, you know, Philemon and so forth, had a home fellowship. Different types of ministries were going on, but the important part was the fellowship that we had one with another, the accountability, the encouragement, the prayer. Those are the things that, that should be the center of our fellowship. It's, it's nice to fellowship and, you know, and, and go out and have fun. You know, let's go shoot guns. That's a good thing, and there's nothing wrong with that. But have some fellowship where, where there's some worship. Uh, where Jesus is the conversation, where there's prayer for one another, uh, where we're corporately praying in those fellowships and in those times. It's a good thing to have. It builds us up. It strengthens us. When you isolate yourself, then you're alone. Then you begin to fall into sin or fall away from the Lord. You isolate yourself from believers. You start nitpicking. You start looking at uh, people or churches and, and you start finding the flaws in everything and it justifies you uh, falling away it justifies you not fellowshipping with these places well believe me you'll find plenty of flaws you'll find find plenty of disagreements in in every church any church that you go to there's enough there if you look enough you know what's important is that we keep the central thing the central thing and that is Jesus Christ and in fellowship with him and so we need to fellowship. It's important that we fellowship. This event that we're having on the 13th, it's, it's a big event. You're talking eight hours um, of giving up of your time and so forth. But in a sense, it's fellowship. And we're making Christ the center of this fellowship. We are taking an opportunity to open up his words and study from it and hopefully uh, gain from it a victorious life during the battles that we have. And we can do this together corporately as I lead you through the chapter, as Roman leads you through a chapter, and as we talk about it and so forth, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Uh, if you think it's not a good thing or it's a waste of time, then there's something wrong with your relationship with Christ. Those are good things. Conferences are good things. They're, they're good to fellowship one with another. I encourage you, find a conference. Go to a conference and just sit and take in the Word of God. It's the most amazing thing that you could ever do to to sit all day long from seven o'clock in the morning till nine o'clock at night which is more than 12 hours and, and have worship have praise have a message have worship have praise have a message go eat come back have worship have praise and you're just getting fed you're spiritually connected to the lord you're connected to to the whole place of people that are there i mean it's just an awesome place to be it, it's like you died and went to heaven and you can do this for two, three days, and you're thinking, man, I don't want to go home. I just want to stay here. I just want to continue this. That's what heaven's going to be like. And every time I go to a conference, that's exactly how I feel. It's like you're in the presence of God all day long. There's no time to watch TV. There's no time to watch the news. There's no time to think about what this person's doing or that person's doing or nitpicking this. You're just focused on God. You're worshiping God all day long. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And we should be looking at these opportunities as beautiful things to fellowship one with another. And so Jeremiah was told to be antisocial. Now you could be antisocial to an individual because they're in sin. And the Bible does say that if a person is in sin, then you should not fellowship with this person. That hopefully they will wake up and get out of the sin and come back into the church. But those are isolated situations. Those are situations where you're praying and God is directly telling you to be antisocial. But normally, we're not to be antisocial. We're to be in fellowship. He goes on in verse 10, It shall be when you, sh you show this people all these words, and they say to you, Why has the Lord pronounced all this great disaster against us? Or what is our iniquity? Or what is our sin that we have committed against the Lord our God? Now, by this time, you, you, you would think that Judah would have understood why this is coming upon them. But it just shows you how blind they are. They, they still don't see it. They don't understand that they're in sin. Not only are they in sin, they're in worse sin than they're, even their forefathers were in. They're, they're so corrupt. Uh, when you read Ezekiel and you see what was in the temple itself, the idolatry that was there, they bring in these idols and they were worshiping them in the temple of God. That's pretty bad. And when it gets that bad, you would say, well, God's doing something here. 
He's trying to wake us up. You know, it's interesting how we go through things and we oftentimes do not ask ourselves, what am I doing? Is there something that I am doing in my life personally that's bringing this on? Is God trying to get my attention? We don't ask that question. Usually the first thing is, Lord, why are you doing this? You know, why me? Can you take it away? You know, stop it. But we never ask, Lord, what is it in me that you're trying to remove from my own life? Something that I need to give up? Something I need to stop? What is it, Lord? Show me. And then when he shows us, we have to give it up. We have to let it go. We have to grow through that. And then God begins to work again in another way. We need to be open with what God is doing in our lives. It says, then you shall say to them, that is Jeremiah, to the people, because your fathers have forsaken me, says the Lord. They have walked after other gods and have served them and worshipped them and have forsaken me and not kept my law. And you have done worse than your fathers. For behold, each one follows the dictates of his own evil heart, so that no one listens to me. So no one listens to me. Again, he uses that same phrase. He's been using it all the way up until these chapters that these people are just doing their own thing. There's that phrase, you know, follow your own heart. You know, well, if you feel it in your heart, go ahead and do it. Well, I really feel it in my heart. It's the right thing to do. It might be if it's scriptural. But if it's not scriptural, then it's the wrong thing to do, whether your heart's telling you that or not. So the Lord patiently replies to their question in two folds. Their fathers forsook them, and also they have done worse than their fathers. Therefore, I will cast you out of this land into a land that you do not know, neither you nor your fathers, and there you shall serve other gods day and night. There I will show you favor, or not show you favor. Now, he squeezes in this judgment in verse 14 and 15, a encouraging point. He says, therefore, behold, days are coming, says the Lord, that it shall no more be said, the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. But the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from the land where he had driven them. For I will bring them back unto their land, which I give to their fathers. So what he's saying here, there will be a time after 70 years where God will bring the children of Israel back from the north, that is Babylon. And so the people will cry out. They won't cry out like Egypt, but they will cry out, he delivered us out of Babylon. Some have called this the second exodus in a sense. Here they were in, 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 in Egypt for so many years, 470 years or so in Egypt, and then God delivers them from Egypt. And now in Babylon, there's 70 years in Babylon, and then God delivers them from Babylon. When you read the, the the book of Ezra, you know, what, 10, 12 chapters or so, you find an interesting thing going on there, that, that God gives uh, King Cyrus this, this desire to let the nations return to their homes. So he, he takes over Belshazzar, destroys Babylon. He comes in, and he's he's a different type of ruler. He doesn't rule with an iron fist. He's more of a... a, a, a what would you call it, uh, more diplomat in, in the way he does things. Uh, he wants cooperation, and yet he wants tribute at the same time. And so what he does is he goes to all the different nations, and he tells them, look, where are you from? Gather your people together and go home. I want you to go home. Still pay tribute to me. I'm still the ruling king in this kingdom, but you can go home now. And he goes to the Israelites and does the same thing. And so he goes to Ezra, Jerusalem, And he says, go home, take everything you have. In fact, whatever Babylon took from you in the temple, you can take it back. And they went back and they were rejoicing. It says that the young were rejoicing because they came back and they began to rebuild this temple. And it says the old were weeping because they could remember the time when the temple was built. And they were worshiping the Lord in that temple. And in Ezra, Ezra, it says that you couldn't tell the difference from the rejoicing and the weeping as they were all crying together. It was a beautiful thing to exit. And that's what God promised them, to come back into the land. 
Judah, though judgment is coming and for 70 years, but I promise you that, that you will come out of that. And then he goes back to the judgment. Behold, I will send for many fishermen, says the Lord, and they shall fish them. And afterwards I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the holes of the rocks, for my eyes are all on their ways. Hmm, that's a scary thought. God's eyes are on all of our ways. He, he knows our ways. He knows our hearts uh, much better than we know our own heart. They're not hidden from my eyes or my face, nor is your iniquity hidden from my eyes. The first I, and first I will repay double for their iniquity and their sin because they have defiled my land. They have filled my inheritance with the carcasses of their detestable and abominable idols. So to emphasize the impossibility of escaping this coming judgment, God gives them a picture of fishermen and hunters. And so like the fishermen who gather their fish and nets and so forth, so you'll be gathered, guaranteed. The fisherman goes out, he catches fish. He puts his nets, he, he baits his hooks, and he will draw you in. So Babylon will come like fishermen and they'll draw you in. He says, like a hunter who goes out and hunts after his prey, he will do the same thing. Babylon will come after you and they will get you, they will catch you, and they will take you. No one's going to escape is what he's saying here. You all will be judged. Now Jeremiah praises the Lord here in these last few verses as he cries out, literally crying out to the Lord for, for strength here. He says, O oh Lord, my, my strength and my fortress, my refuge in the day of affliction, the Gentiles shall come to you from the ends of the earth and say, surely our fathers have inherited lies, worthlessness, and unprofitable things. Uh, first, Jeremiah realized that his strength comes from the Lord. That the Lord was his fortress. That's the only way that you can endure through the trials of life and the battles of life. Is by making the Lord your strength and your fortress. He had to do some really crazy things. He had to be antisocial. How do you get through something like that? That's a difficult thing to do. Uh, to, to not participate as you see your family and so forth participating. And then God says, don't do it. And so how do you get through that? You focus on the Lord. This is something the Lord has told me to do. I'm being faithful to him. He is directing me and guiding me, so he'll be my strength. I know that you love me, Lord. I know there's a purpose from this, Lord. I know that you're going to work all this out for good, and so I have to be faithful and continue to do it. It's the only way that you can go through it. Again, um, we'll be celebrating 20 years in the ministry this coming uh, January, and it's neat because everything's falling into place. We had a meeting today, called a few people that we're going to invite to do worship and so forth, and it looks like a lot of them are going to be coming. Videos will be coming down the pike from, from people that started with us from years ago. And, and so it's kind of, uh, kind of exciting. But um, there was a time when, when we lost something. Uh, we, could, we could find pictures up to a certain point, and then we, we kind of lost something, and then all of a sudden it starts up again these last six, six years or so. So there was a dead space there, that dead space. And, and I could probably tell you a lot of stories about that dead space. You know, but how did I get through? How did the people, my wife, get through? How did those that have been with us get through? The only way we've gotten through is keeping our eyes on the Lord. There's a time where, where uh, you don't even look at what's going on in the church. You look at God and being faithful to God. That's all you look at. Because there was a time when there was probably a third of you on a Wednesday night. And when none of you really were even coming here. And that's when you keep your eyes on the Lord. You're not looking at the numbers, you're looking at God. Though the numbers can affect you. You know, and they would periodically, but the only way to get through it is looking at God. Okay, Lord, I'm being faithful to what you called me to do. And I know that you have a purpose for this and a reason. And if it's not for me, then it's for someone else down the road. I don't know. I just have to be faithful to what you have called me to do. We have to keep our eyes on the Lord. He is our strength. He is our fortress. Uh, no one else is. They'll fail you. 
they will fail you. Believe me, they will fail you. <clears throat> when you have a, a church the size of Calvary Chapel, F Fort Lauderdale, and the senior pastor fails that many people, what keeps that church together? The Lord. And keeping your eyes on the Lord. That's why that church is successful today. Because their eyes are not on a man. It's on the Lord. Will a man make gods for himself, which are not gods? Therefore, behold, I will this one's cause them to know. I will cause them to know my hand and my might. And they shall know that my name is the Lord. So he closes basically this chapter with a confirmation, you know, and a confidence in God that he is his strength and his fortress. So we come now to chapter 17. <clears throat> We've got plenty of time. In this chapter, it, it contains a collection of different messages. It, it, it's kind of, kind of like a, a poems here and there. They're not all related together. He just throws in a bunch of messages, miscellaneous uh, conclusions and, and thoughts. And so, as we go through this, it may not all just flow very easily. Um, but he he talks about sin in this first section here and the punishment of Judah. The sin of Judah is written with a pin of iron, but the point of a diamond, now that's interesting, a point of a diamond. Diamonds were so available, they used them as pins. You know, I don't know how they got the ink on them, you know, whether they dipped them in or what, but they used diamonds as pins. It is engraved on the tablet of their hearts and on the horn of your altar. Now, their sin, their, their sins are, right? The sins are written with pin and iron, pointed diamonds. They're engraved on the tablets of their hearts. It's not that it was written on paper, but the sin is in their hearts. It's written very clearly, and God could read the heart. And the horn of your altar, the horn of the Lord, so is where his strength is. They had, uh, as they offered up the sacrifices to the Lord, and they pour the blood upon the strength of the Lord, the horns, and so forth. While their children remember their altars and their wooden images by the green trees on the high hills, again, the idolatry. O oh, my mountains in the field, I will give a plunder, I will give as plunder your wealth, all your treasures, and your high places of sin within all your borders. And you, even yourself, shall let go of your heritage which I gave you, and I will cause you to serve your enemies in the land which you do not know, for you have kindled a fire in my anger which shall burn forever. Now, when you think about <clears throat> the tools that he's using to engrave, um, these are instruments that, that will literally carve into stones or, or, or metal. And so they're permanent, they're deep. And that's how deep and permanent the sins that they have committed that has angered God, the children of Israel. God is angry about sin because it cost him something. The wage of sin is death. It cost us something. Sin separates us from God. It's, it's our sins that have separated us from God. God does want, not, not want to be separated, but it's our sins that have separated us from our God. And so God hates sin. He loves the sinner, but he hates sin because he sees that it destroys. And it cost him the life of his son in order to pay for the penalty of sin. And so there's a good reason for God to hate sin in our lives. As Judah's sin was engraved in their hearts. And so the Lord will judge each person. Look at verse 5. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is a man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. Now there's another good point there. We can't depend upon our strength our own strength or man's strength, whose heart departs from the Lord, for he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the 
parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord, for he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, which shall spread out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Now these verses here that we're reading are viewed as words of wisdom. Uh, They're taken from Psalms. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Psalms 1 is what he's quoting partially here. We know Psalms 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. This psalm is a beautiful psalm. It really directs us in how we should walk with the Lord. Psalms 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. What is that counsel of the ungodly? Doesn't seek the wisdom of this world. Doesn't seek the psychology of this world. Doesn't seek the philosophy of this world. What does he seek? He seeks God's wisdom and truth in his word. Nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. His delight is in the word of the Lord. That's what I love about Calvary Chapel. It's the word, it's the word, it's the word, it's the word. And then comes along in the early 1800s, Sigmund Freud, and he says, we don't like the word of God telling the people what and how they should live. And so let's come up with a human observation and we will begin to direct and guide them. And that's how psychology began. Let's forget the word and let's tell them what we think they should uh, uh, do or be doing. And so we'll list all of the human faults that are not normal, you know, tendencies in humanity like lying that's not a sin lying is something that that people do it's it's a problem in their life and so it's it's listed as one of the dysfunctions of humanity you know at one point in psychology homosexuality was in their book of dysfunctions in humanity they've taken it out now funny how it can change it just depends on the culture well in the bible it's very clear that homosexuality is a sin and it still says it to this day, homosexuality is a sin. God hasn't taken it out. You know, you know what's even sadder? As we as believers, we don't see that. We still trust in human wisdom. We don't trust in God's word. And that's, that's really a sad place to be when we don't trust God's word, when we don't believe it, when we actually question, well, could that really be true? I mean, why would he even ask that? Do you know what we're really saying when when we don't trust God's word or we question God's word? We're pretty much telling God, do you know what you're doing? Are you sure you want me to do this? Are you sure this is going to work? You know, I, I don't know if this is going to work. Are you sure you know what you're doing, God? That's what we're doing when we question his word. We need to receive his word. His word is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to penetrate into our very thoughts and the very heart of our lives. We're to live on it because it's like food. It will guide us and nourish us and strengthen us in every way as it runs our life. But we as Christians go to alternatives. And so so what we've had to do as Christians is we've had to su- somehow separate and say, okay, we still have psychology and we still have psychiatrists, but we have Christian psychologists and Christian you know, uh, philosophies and we separate ourselves from the world and we've made them Christianized in, in a sense. But they still hold to the, to the basic principles of the others, psychologists in the world and so forth. Why don't we just get back to biblical guidance and principles? That would be the easiest thing to do. That would be the easiest thing to do. We are to love the law of the Lord and meditate day and night on it. And he shall be like what? A tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth corruption and evil and heartaches and pain and suffering. No, that's not what it says. Bring forth fruit in its season whose leaf shall not wither and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so. Pretty clear. It's pretty clear, you know, that what we need to do is get back to the Word of God and get out of this worldly psychology as Paul told us. Get out of the world. You were once of the world, but you're no longer of it. Get out of it and get back into that relationship with, with Christ. He goes on. 
in verse 9 to really settle it. The heart is deceitful above all things. Well, how many things? A few things? No, it's all things. Our hearts are deceitful above all things. It, it's the most defeat, deceitful thing that we know of. It's our heart. Our hearts have a tendency to sin. It says it's desperately wicked. Who can know it? You can't know it. I can't know your heart. It's a wicked heart. Boy, we should accept that, shouldn't we? If we would just realize that all our hearts are wicked and deceitful, then we should just have more grace for one another. I know I have a tendency in my mind. I can tell you some things in my mind that are always popping up, thinking, man, my heart is weak, wicked, deceitful. I could be having a conversation with somebody. They can be telling me something, and in my mind I'm going, are they lying to me? It's like, I don't believe them. It's like Because my, my heart just can't trust. You know, just can't trust. Instead of just realizing, okay, that's their story. Wonderful, great, God's going to work, you know. But our hearts are wicked, deceitful. And this, in the Hebrew, is an emphatic denial. Emphatic denial that our hearts are, are good, in a, in a sense. You know, they, that philosophy is we're basically good people. That's a lie. That's a lie. Emphat- emphatically, we are deceitful above all things. And the only remedy for this is nothing but a rebirth. It's the only thing. I heard a pastor one time say, be careful who you put into leadership because people don't change. People don't change. And I remember him saying it. It stuck to me to this day. I remember it just as clearly. I know who it is. I won't say who it is. But I just thought, okay, it stuck with me. (sighs) People don't change. I'm thinking... I'm thinking of all the scriptures where it says that we should change. We become new creatures. You know, the old things passed away in Corinthians. You know, you're born again. There's a lot of scriptures that talk about we should change. So how can he say people don't change? Uh, that doesn't make sense. So what is he saying there? I think what he's saying is, is be careful who you put in. Make sure you're putting in a born again believer. One who is willing to change. Because that should be the heart of every believer is to change, to grow, to mature. Don't stay in the same place in your spiritual walk. You should be growing in your spiritual walk on a daily basis. If you're still there like when you were in the beginning, something's wrong. You're not growing. You're not reading. You're not praying. You're not stretching. And you need to stretch. And that's what fellowship does, right? It, it, it causes us to stretch and to grow and to encourage one another to do so. I hear it every once in a while from people. You know, I'm so glad we're here. You know, I'm growing. The Lord's working. I seem to be loving the word it more. I'm seeming to pray more. And God is expanding me and my, broadening my borders and so forth, you know, because he's working in your lives. But we should be growing. We should be maturing. We should be changing changing on a daily basis yeah there are some things in our lives that don't change they should change but we haven't pursued the change Uh, we're comfortable in them we like it you know we're not ready yet and God's working and he may all of a sudden do something that all of a sudden you change we can all think of a thing that we just don't want to change right and I've been sharing with you lately about my relationship with my my wife and I and I have to change I have to change now for a while there I didn't want to change I didn't want to change I I liked I I liked being who I was and I didn't think there was anything wrong with that you know at all now let's just take the situation and it's just one situation with the animals I mean I I mean I don't hate animals I just don't like them you know but she loves them. And just the other day, all of a sudden I see her cutting up apples and grapes and bananas. And I'm like, are you making like a fruit salad? And she looked at me. She goes, no. I go, what's all that for? Oh, for the animals. I'm like, what? <laughs> you're kidding me, right? You're, you're kidding me. You're going to give all this fruit and stuff? That, for Well, it's just a treat. 
It's just a treat. I liked it once in a while. You know, in my old nature, I would have said, why are you wasting money? I would have just, why are you wasting money? Why are you giving them caviar and filet mignon when they have pellets they could be eating? They don't know the difference. <sighs> I would have done that. And I just looked at her and like, like, you're kidding me, right? And that's all I said. And so then again tonight, I, all of a sudden I see her come out with a big old bowl. I'm like making a casserole or, or a stew and all these fruits and apples and carrots all sticking out. I'm going, she's going out to feed the animals. And I didn't say one word because I'm trying to change. You know, I'm trying to say, that's what she likes doing. It's costing me, but that's what she likes doing. So I didn't say a word. She went out in the rain and got soaking wet, and you know, but she liked doing that, and she fed her animals. See, we need to change those little things that don't matter. You know, I'll give you another one. <laughs> I love my grass. I mean, most of you know this. I love my grass. I love landscaping and so forth. I like my grass green. I fertilize every month. You know, I just everything's got to be perfect. And all of a sudden, I see these yellow spots coming up when we first got the animals, and that would just I would get so angry and frustrated, yellow spots all over. And I'm just like, can't you get them to go down there by the dirt, you know, instead of right here on the grass? And she looks at me and she says, that's mold from you watering too much. <laughs> I'm like, am I dumb? Am I stupid here? I'm like, M are you serious? That's not mold? <laughs> You gotta be kidding! And, and I could just feel myself just. You know, now I see all the spots all over the place, and I don't say anything because I gotta change. It doesn't matter that there's yellow spots on my grass. I'm I am valuing those yellow spots over her is what I'm doing. Those spots are more important than she is. That's what I'm doing. And I have to change. We have to be willing to change. Even things that we think we're right in. We think we're right in. And you might be right, but it doesn't matter. Because she's more valuable or he's more valuable than those things. You really have to ask yourself, and she tells me this all, will it matter in 100 years from now? Well, how about 10 years? Because I might be, <laughs> might be gone in 10 years. You know? So no, in 10 years, no, it's not going to matter. You know, I probably won't even care you know, at all, you know. but we should change, and, and that's what the Lord is expecting from them, is change, he says in verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart, and I test the mind, even to give every man according to his way, according to the fruit of his doing, boy, if he knows the heart, and he knows it's deceitful and wicked, what do you think he will give us, death, that's what we deserve, is death, we don't deserve anything, when we begin to lift ourselves up over another individual, we should be reminded of this, that he knows our hearts. He knows our hearts. Nothing's hidden from him. He also knows when we do good, though, too. He knows when you have a good heart. He knows you want to do the right thing. He knows you want to be helpful. He knows you really want to love your spouse. You really do, more than anything else. And I've been really sensing that lately with her, with her animal lover Virginia <laughs> I'm just like I don't know it's just I, I see it's just like our love for one another and our relationship has been been rekindled um, because I want to love her more and it just seems like she's responding to that too and we're just having such a, a great time recently and I hope it lasts at least for a couple more days <laughs> hopefully years As a partridge that broods but does not hatch, so is he who gets riches, but not by right. It will leave him in the midst of his days, and at the end he will be a fool. So there's a proverb there. A, a warning at getting your wealth illegally. A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. 
Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. And now Jeremiah begins to ask for personal help here. He says, heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. You ever pray that before? you know, with the Lord? Have you ever just really believed him? Lord, just, Lord, if you heal me, Lord, I know I'll be healed. Lord, if you give me wisdom, I know that you'll give it to me, Lord. Lord, if I pray right now for, for you to just really touch this person or individual, I know that you'll do it, Lord, because he's capable of doing it. We need to pray that way with faith. Indeed, they say to me, where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. As for me, I have not hurried away from being a shepherd who follows you or a pastor who follows you, nor have I desired the woeful day. You know what came out of my lips. It was right there before you. Do not be a terror to me. Again, Jeremiah's asking the Lord, don't, don't be a terror to me, Lord. You're my hope in the day of doom. Let them be ashamed who persecute me but do not let me be put to shame. Let them be dismayed, but do not let me be dismayed. Bring on them the day of doom and destroy them with double destruction. You ever pray one of those prayers (laughs) for your enemies? I've been there plenty of times. I know plenty of pastors who've been there, who've been accused of various things. And you just, you learn to just smile and say, okay, Whatever, I trust in the Lord. Now we come to verse 19 to the rest of the chapter and, and Jeremiah is, is really teaching the people here how they ought to fellowship one with another and not be antisocial. Now God asked him to be antisocial and now he ends with keep the Sabbath, keep it holy, go to church, get involved, participate, have fellowship. And he understands the Sabbath. I mean, he's the son of a priest. He's a prophet called by God. And now he says, respect the Sabbath day. Thus says the Lord, said to me, go and stand in the gate of the children of the people by which the kings of Judah come in and by which they go out. This was a place where everything was settled, the gates. When we were in Israel, we actually went to a place where um, there was a gate and possibly the gate of Abraham. Uh, and this gate had a door, a huge door, a big gate. This is where everybody sat. Uh, you could see uh, as you open up the gate and you walk in, there were places right along the walls as you walk in, seats all over, and people would sit there, and the judges and the men would sit there, and this is where everything was judged. This was where everything was taken care of. So he's now telling him, go to the gates. And say to them, hear the word of the Lord, you kings of Judah and all Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem who enter by these gates. Thus says the Lord, take heed to yourselves and bear no burden on the Sabbath day. So first thing is remember the Sabbath is a holy day. You shouldn't be working. You should bear no burdens. You should be a day of worship and praise and directing towards the Lord. Nor bring it in the gate, by the gates of Jerusalem, nor carry a burden out of your house on the Sabbath day, nor do any work, but hollow the Sabbath day. It's a holy day. It's, it's a day we come to church and we worship and praise the Lord and we fellowship and we encourage one. And then we go home and we, we have fellowship with our families and we rest on that day in remembrance of what God has given us. As an example of what he's given to us, when he rested on the seventh day after creating the heavens and the earth, big job. And then he rested on the last day. An example to us that we should also rest on that day. As I commanded your fathers, but they did not obey nor incline their ears, but made their neck stiff that they might not hear nor receive instructions. And it shall be, if you heed me carefully, says the Lord, to bring no burden through the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, but hollow the Sabbath day, to do no work in it, then shall enter the gate of the city kings and princes sitting on the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, they and their princes, 
accompanied by the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the city shall remain forever. If you keep it holy, then God will continue to allow you to come in and out and be blessed forever and ever. And they shall come from the cities of Judah, from the places all around Jerusalem, from the land of Benjamin, from the lowlands and from the mountains, from the south, bringing burnt offerings and sacrifice and grain offerings and incense and bringing sacrifice of praise to the house of the Lord. It's all the fellowship that they're having one with another. But if you will not heed me to hollow the Sabbath day, such as not carrying a burden, then entering the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in its gates, and it shall devour the places of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Now I'm not suggesting that we don't have liberty on the Sabbath day. But the Sabbath day is to hear the word of the Lord. That's why we so highly encourage you that if you're in ministry, sit in church on the Sabbath day. Hear from the Lord. Hear from the Lord and what he is sharing to the, this body, this part of the body of Christ. And staying in tune and in direction so that we can march forward in what the Lord wants to do in this little church here. And in any other church, uh, you want to be in unity with the pastor and the leadership. You want to know the direction you want to know where you need to be, and you can't do that if you're not here. You can come here, in a sense, on the Sabbath day and carry a burden, carry a work. You serve here, and you're serving here, and that's a work, but you don't sit here, and you don't worship. You don't hollow the day to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to his word, and you go off and you do your thing without worshiping and praising the Lord. We need to keep the Sabbath day holy. Now, Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, right? It was made for us. It's for our benefit to do so. It's not a, a, a law today that we are to keep it on a regular basis, otherwise we lose our salvation. It is a spiritual law and truth and a principle that we keep it because it is our reflection and love for God and how we approach him, and hollow him. And so it's made for us, and not a law or a commandment, or, or, or should it become a burden. If it becomes a burden, then it's because you're carrying the load on the Sabbath day. But if it's done with the heart, and it's done with a desire to keep it holy, and separate it, consecrate it unto the Lord, then it's not a burden. It's actually a service and a joy to be here on the Sabbath day. And so he encourages them, don't be antisocial. Be in church, be in fellowship. <clears throat> be like that tree planted by the river of water and its seasons will have fruit and the fruit will be for others. Too many times people I mean we see the example and some of the ministers that we listen to on the radio and on TBN and other places where they're constantly <clears throat> begging for money, where they're constantly begging for the people to support them so that they can ride their, you know, Mercedes or Beamers, so they can have their mansions and jets to fly places. They're fleecing the flock because it's a work for them. It's not a holy Sabbath day where they worship the Lord. That's wrong when people use other people. So, I'm here to take from you. I don't want to give to you. When Christianity is about giving and not taking. The Bible even says you're more blessed if you what? Take? <laughs> take? Yeah, I'm blessed when I take. No, it's when you give. And the widow gave everything that she had, everything she had. It's more blessed to give. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve, to serve. You know? And of course, Martha chose a better thing to sit at the feet of Jesus. You know? And so realizing that in our fellowship, one with another, don't be antisocial unless God calls you to be to a certain group or family or person because of sin in their lives. But other than that, fellowship. 